minute break. Um, ma'am, you may step down. Do not discuss your testimony. You will be back on the stand for cross. Yes, sir. Judge. Yes. Find out what this defense attorney said to the judge and why it shocked the sensibilities of the court. What happened next was a courtroom drama far more compelling than most crime fiction. In the early morning hours of March 11, 2017, Trevor Summers manipulated his 14-year-old daughter into letting him into their mother's house at night. He was estranged from his wife, Elisa, and the couple had mutual restraining orders against them. You won't want to miss what happened after that, because this is absolutely criminal. Trevor and Elisa Summers had five children together, but they were going through a divorce. On March 11, 2017, her 14-year-old and her two younger children were staying in her home. Mom and the toddlers were asleep in her bed, but the older daughter planned to sleep downstairs, at least as far as Elisa knew. But her real plan was to wait for everyone to fall asleep and let her father through the window. Protective orders be damned. He said he knew he could convince Mom to renew their marriage. He just needed to wake her up and talk it out. At the time, Elisa was betrayed by her daughter. The teenager had been conditioned by her dad to hate her mother and her new boyfriend. Assistant State Attorney Jessica O'Connor's opening statement had already laid out the timeline of that morning for the jury but nothing compared to hearing the testimony of the brave survivor and first-hand witness. The defense attorney in this case did the absolute best with what he had to work with, but from an armchair lawyer's perspective, it's never good when your defense attorney spends most of his opening statement waxing poetic about the importance of civic duty and presumption of innocence. You are performing a most important civic duty and privilege being here. We need you here. Trust in the collective wisdom of the jury. Gather the facts, put the facts together with the law, make a conclusion if a crime was committed, what crime that was. Thank you very much. Initially, Trevor's standby counsel, Anthony Marchese, was appointed at the last moment to represent him. He admitted that he never felt so unprepared to represent a client in his career. But Judge Christopher C. Sabella was frustrated with the repeated defendant-induced delays in the case, and he ordered jury selection to begin. Bearing the name of her new husband, she had come a long way since her last day as Elisa Summers. Back on March 13, 2017, she was a broken woman on the verge of death and in need of rescue. She told the horrific tale of her captivity on the stand under direct examination. As much as I could fight back, I did. As much as I could try to get loose, I did. Um, but at some point, I came to the realization of my situation. I am, I am stuck. I'm tied to this bed. I'm not getting out. This, of course, was not the first incident of violence in their marriage, as Trevor had a history of this behavior with a temporary protective order to boot. That resulted from an incident less than a month earlier. Trevor Summers held me against my will at knife point on February 18th. He contacted me and wanted to do a marriage settlement agreement. He was being extremely kind to me, said that he was accepting that the marriage was over and that he had already had prepared the marriage settlement agreement, but um, asked me if I would have sex with him one last time in our marriage. So is that something that you did agree to? I did. Was that sex consensual? Yes. Um, and so what happened after that? The notary came. And we sat with the notary. We had the forms notarized. 50-50 custody of the children. 
uh, child support and alimony and um, just a, an agreement of splitting holidays and, and things along those lines. And was he going to provide you a check on that day? Yes. What was that check? It was uh, $25,000. The uneasy peace the couple were enjoying would only be temporary. You see, when a man like Trevor Summers is given an inch, he takes a light year. Elisa was adrift in a familiar eddy of abuse and apologies. What happened next? He asked me if I would stay and have a drink with him. And did you do that? I did. He said, well, now that we have signed this agreement and it's notarized, it's kind of like we're not married now. Can we have sex again? And I, and I did. I ate with him and then I said, I really have to get home to the children. I, I need to leave. And he said, oh, I almost forgot I have something else for you. And we went back inside and I followed him in to the house and followed him into the master bedroom. And he turned into the closet and turned back and pushed me down onto the bed and pulled a knife out from between the, the mattress and the box spring. And he held a machete at, at my at my chest. He told me that he was not okay with the divorce, that what I had done and destroyed the family, that he was not going to take this and that I was going to stay and listen to him. I was held for a few hours and just, um, sat on the bed. Eventually I was able to talk him down, calm him down, and I got into my car and left. And prior to him letting you leave, did you promise him that you were not going to call the police? I did. Um, once you left, did you in fact call the police? As soon as I pulled out of his driveway. After being terrorized, tied up, and tied down to the bed, she used her intelligence and persuasion to escape the situation. The court granted her an injunction prohibiting Trevor from contacting her. Now back to the afternoon of March 11th. Controlling Trevor continued to secure his prey with various household items. I got first tied up about approximately 6, 6 a.m. on that Saturday morning. Um, after he used the Christmas lights to tie me to the bed rails, he went and got the vacuum and brought the vacuum in and used the vacuum cord to go underneath the mattress and wrap oh, around. Was he aware that you were moving on romantically in your life? Yes. I had met someone. I had met Jeff Matthewson, who is now my husband, but at the time we had, we had just met. He was intent on punishing Elisa for moving on without him. He gave her fictitious hope that she'd be let go, floating his implausible plan of escaping to international waters. Did the defendant have problems with the fact that you were moving on from him? Yes. In our marriage, I was never allowed to speak to a, a man or... Um, have men on my Facebook or have anything to do unless it was supervised. He started telling me that he was going to disappear. He was getting a boat to international water. Uh, he had chartered this boat that was going to take him out of the country, basically no papers, no questions asked, and that it would be, he would be leaving approximately an at 9 a.m. It's like, okay, three hours and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be fine in three hours. Are there conversations that are taking during, taking place during this time? It was a, a lot of um, kind of rambling type conversations. He would just talk about just random things about money and offshore accounts and he's get, got this boat and he's going to the islands. Every ounce of mental energy she had was focused on just getting through to nine o'clock. That's when her international man of mystery would charter a boat and disappear forever. While it's true to say Trevor had an exit plan, it likely didn't involve the two of them surviving. 
Every time Elisa thought she had the end in sight, Trevor would move the goalpost. So nine o'clock came and went, and approximately 10 o'clock, he comes in and says, there's no more boats running. They only run them at nighttime. I'm gonna be here until night comes. He started to undo all of the things that had me tied to the bed, undo even the scarves and completely untied me. He started to remove my bottoms and proceeded to have sex with me. Is, um, was that with your consent, that sex? No. What was going through your head at that time? Just need to, just need to get through this day. I'll just get through this day. What happened when the sex was over with? Um, I was now untied. I was able to get up and put my, my bottoms on. At this point, he is staying right on, on top of me, not allowing me to have kind of free range of things. So he is just his body, like right up against my body. The worst was yet to come. As Elisa was about to be hogtied, Summers used her thumb to unlock the same iPhone that he'd earlier recruited his children to spy on for information about her love life. What he did next would go on to obliterate any reasonable doubt of his guilt. He tied me for the second time. How were you tied up this time? This time was hog tied. He put um, duct tape over my mouth and I started struggling because I was having problems breathing because I had some congestion and I just, I just couldn't breathe out of my nose. And so he removed the duct tape and told me that as long as I was quiet, he would not have to use the duct tape. He told me that um, he, it, with the conversation about him going to the island, he was disappearing and all of this, and that I would be left, you know, alone with the kids and everything that was his. And I said um, something along the lines is, Nobody's going, nobody's going to believe any of this. And um, he said, I'm going to make a video for you. With his wife now hogtied on the bed, Trevor coldly confessed during this video he made for his children. Today is Saturday, March 11th, and I am here with Lisa at her house. I'm not supposed to be. Um, I'm doing this video because uh, just a confession for her uh, so that people will understand and believe what's happened in the last few months. Um, today's events, my daughter let me in the house around uh, 2 30 and I woke Lisa up and I have been holding her against her will since then. It's uh, 20 after 11, yeah. Um, and uh, I did tie her up uh, to keep her uh, from contacting authorities and give me enough time to get out of town. But the only other thing I'll say is that uh, up until the point I found out about all the dating stuff, uh, I was feeling pretty normal, and um, when I asked about it, and I asked about it, I kept getting different stories, so um, it's just something I couldn't deal with. My mind literally just broke, and I snapped, and, um, and it's just something I can't deal with, so... Uh, Later, he got more intimate with his recording device, coming clean about his evil deeds, after fessing up to tying up and kidnapping their mother, he got misty while addressing his offspring. It's one of the only two times we've spotted genuine emotion in this monster, the other being after he later cross-examined his children in court. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Here's Trevor. The, thing that she's, the things that she's told you about me being good at manipulation and control and lying is true. Um, 
and tying her up today and all that uh, is true. Um, I don't know what's really broken in my head with all this stuff, um, but uh, I need to go away and sort it out. And um, I don't know. By the end of the day, Elisa's testimony was not yet complete, and after a night to refresh, she described life on the road with terrifying Trevor. His hunger must have been fueled by his felonious activities, and they did what countless other couples must have done that morning. But there was something different happening in this particular car. Although nobody could have known by looking, the vehicle displayed a crime in progress for all to see and the victim trapped behind its glass was too terrified to cry out for help. So before we got into the drive through um, line, he told me if I made any motions to anyone, if I tried to escape, that he would slit my throat. So we got into the drive through I sat in the front seat, I handed him the money from my wallet and paid for the McDonald's. I looked around to see if there was any opportunity, but I was afraid. Um, did you do anything to alert the teller that took your money, the person that gave you your uh, McDonald's food at yeah. all? Yeah. After using his victim's funds for breakfast, they pulled into a gas station to refuel. Trevor then drove to Anna Maria Island for his supposed rendezvous with a vessel that will whisk him away to a new life. Then he... Um, at this point, I'd moved up to where there was more room mm -hmm. in the second row. And then he went to, climbed back to the third row and said, I think it's best if you stay behind for the children, you can get medical attention and I am going to leave you everything. When he for says that you should stay, I mean, what were you thinking at that point? Oh, I was, I was so relieved. I was so thankful. I was so happy. I... I just said, well, if you think that's best, but I think it's really good for the kids, and that way, you know, it, it'll just be better for the whole situation all the way around. Um, and so did you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, was did you see that as your opportunity to be free? Yes. With his apparent plan in place, Trevor wrote an impromptu will and a letter to his children. But of course there was no boat. And if all went according to his true plan, those children would be orphans by sunset. He kept up the ruse, however, and the couple embarked on a futile flag-finding mission. And then he wrote another letter for the children, and he said it was between him and the kids. And that's when then he told me, okay, whoops. now the new plan is you help me find the safe house. We need to look for a green and yellow flag. And we drove around Anna Maria Island and I looked all around for this yellow and green flag because once I found this yellow and green flag and he was going to go onto a boat and I was going to be able to live my life. Elisa's captor again drove the pair to a new spot, which was supposedly the location of the safe house. When they arrived, he tied her up. His mask would slip again, revealing the true evil underneath all those empty promises of her release. He tied me to the chair, and because of the position of how he tied me, my hands are, are like this because of the, the, the pull of the rope pulling my hands back. So I'm, I'm in this position. What happens after that? Rope came from behind me, over my head, and because my, of the position of my hands, they grabbed my hands and he pulled the rope back and started strangling me. Elisa was at the mercy of a madman with a rope around her neck. This was how it would end and her world went dark. But at just that very moment, her predator was spooked by an approaching vehicle. He suddenly stopped and dove into the driver's seat just through the whole car over and, and just got into the driver's seat and peeled out of there. And I am start gasping for air and I'm like, 
what is going on? And I look back and I see a, a black pickup truck behind us. Does he say anything when he dove into the front driver's seat? He didn't until he pulled <clears throat> underneath a house on stilts. You said he peeled out of there. Is he driving quickly to this house with stilts? Yes. Did you know this person that lived there? No. Did he tell you why he was going to this house? He told me that was the safe house. Law enforcement, having been on alert since the 9-11 call from Walgreens. Summers then drove to a Walgreens where Elisa, with her hands tied behind her back, tried to get away. A Walgreens employee saw everything and called police. We're closing in just as Trevor pulled under the stilted safe house. He put on a histrionic and bloody display as his options ran out. And he says, there's an unmarked police car right there. And I didn't believe him at this point. Um, Could you see the vehicle that he's referring to? I did. It looked to? like an older Chevy Malibu. And so I, I didn't believe him. And he begun, began slitting his throat and saying, this is what love is. I'm laying my life down for you. You don't deserve this. Trevor Summers tried his best to be a martyr as the monster slashed his own neck with a razor blade in order to lay down his life. It would later be revealed in a written confession that he planned to lay down another life first. This letter to his children somehow tried to justify a murder-suicide as a positive development. The men clearly didn't intend on coming back from wherever he was eventually taking her. Yet here he was, lying in a hospital bed with a self-inflicted neck wound, his abdomen remained uncut, but that didn't stop him from spilling his guts to the curious detectives who introduced themselves and read Trevor his rights. So, uh, my kids have been complaining all week that they wanted to see her. I, I really didn't want them to see her um, because she's been lying to them about the dating and the guys. And I convinced my daughter to let me come say bye. I was literally going to leave town. Uh, Saturday. So my daughter left the window open for me. Um, my son rode with me. And, and the youngest one was actually at home and sleeping. So my kids and I were communicating while I was there. My wife, I was trying to wake her up because I didn't want to start with two little kids that were sleeping with her. Uh, finally, she did wake up, freaked out a little bit because I was there. She knows I'm not supposed to be there because of the uh, temporary injunction. Uh, she calmed down, and I just explained, you know, I really can't deal with all this. Uh, I'm just going to leave town. Years ago, I threw a lot of money away. Uh, offshore accounts, I was going to go and just live in the islands. Finally, around 5 o'clock, my two older kids were still outside. They're like, you know, we're tired, we want to go home. Um, I've been teaching them how to drive. You won't find Trevor Summers on the cover of Parents Magazine anytime soon. The middle-aged daddy of five told his 14-year-old daughter to drive her brother and the other kids home. Somehow, they made the 20-minute journey safely. So they took the two little kids with them, and they drove my car back to my house in Riverview. The whole time, I didn't, I didn't understand. She didn't try to run out of the house out of the window. Uh, she took a couple of cigarette breaks, and then uh, we had sex four times, you know, consensual. It wasn't forced, nothing. This is what messed with my head, and I think this is what broke me mentally, was she's telling me she loves me, and she's telling me we can work it out, we're having sex, but then she's dating, but she, then she wants, you know, to go full with the divorce, so... I really, I really can't explain. She'll have to explain why she's back and forth like that. Finally, around eight o'clock, I was like, "All right, I gotta go. I gotta go say bye to the kids." And I said, "You gotta give me time to get to leave to get out of here." And she said she would. I said, "Okay, I'm gonna tie you up again." And she willingly let me tie her up. Then she started mouthing off and up this, that, and the other. I said, "You know, I can end this right now." And I just grabbed the pillow and put it over her face. And I just listen to her and well, I was just being an ass and you know, pretending like I could suffocate her. 
And then I took it off and I started to down. And you just relax and you calm down. Relax. It's just me breaking into your house at an unknown hour of the night and grabbing you by the ankles. Relax. And she said, you know what? Why don't I just go with you? And so I said, you really want to go with me? You want to leave the country? And she said, yeah. And I said, okay. You know, I said, the kids will be fine. Our pastor and his wife will take care of them or my parents. I said, the kids will be fine. I said, really, they don't deserve either one of us. We're both bad parents. And she agreed. And so then we, we got everything ready. So I said, well, do you want me to stop the store? She's like, yeah. So I, you know, I go walk in, and then I look out, and she's running around the parking lot. And so I grab her and put her back in the car. And I said, what are you doing? When, when she was running around, you saw her. Did anybody see you go out and grab a hold of her? Yeah, there was a, uh, I think it was an employee. Did anybody say anything to you? No. No, he didn't say anything, but I think he dialed me. Please. Some dude just or uh, some shit just ran out of the dude's car. Look like her hands were tied and she ran out of the car and she couldn't help me. And he just uh, grabbed her and put her back in my car. Yeah, I just pulled down this road. Uh, there was a little clearing. It looked like a construction company had some old, old equipment there. I parked, parked there and uh, we both went to sleep. Woke up. I mean, there was a house a thousand feet from us. Right. Uh, and I'm sure people live there, the lights are on and nothing. So you're under the impression now that she wanted to be with you or she was okay being with you? She was okay. She, she still wanted to go with me, leave the country. So then we talked, we started making our story on what we would tell the police. We, uh, we had sex on Sunday. In a car? In a car. Um, I gave her oral sex, she had an orgasm. We had, we had regular sex, she had an orgasm. And I said, no. I don't get it. We're together. Everything's good. Our love life's good. And then we said, well, let's leave around like 5, 6 in the morning. Um, we'll head towards... Uh, first, I said, let's go to Anna Maria Beach. So I think there's a charter I can get. we can get there. And I said, oh, I can't live this life, you know. I said, so I'll, I'll lay my life down for you. And grab my little knife and start cutting my neck. The state of Florida had just finished questioning its star witness, Elisa Mathewson. It was close to the time of the usual mid-morning break, so the jury was excused, and all those present got up and stretched their limbs. Two of the arms reaching skyward at that time belonged to defense attorney Marchese, and he was flagging down the judge, delivering breaking news to his honor. Sabella reacted as if he knew something big was coming. Yes, sir. Yes. I have been informed by Mr. Summers. Yes. That he wishes to discharge me as lead counsel. Okay. He wishes to exercise his fifth minute, his right, sixth minute, right, to represent himself. And I've explained to him that should he choose to do that, that he may have to do that throughout the remainder of the trial. That's absolutely Is correct. It? So I think he must address the court now. The bailiff also has issues. We can do this at the break because they have to do other things if he is going to represent himself. But this is where we are right now. Okay, I appreciate the heads up. Let me uh, talk to Mr. Summers at this point. Mr. Summers, you have a request of the court, sir? Yes, Your Honor. I what would, is it? I would like to um, resume self-representation and discharge Mr. Marchese as lead counsel. And do you believe that to be a wise decision? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Judge Sabella quizzed the defendant in order to properly convey the gravity of his circumstances. You want to represent yourself? I do, Your Honor. I, after seeing how it's going, I'm, I'm comfortable. You understand the potential consequences if the jury finds you guilty as charged? I do, Your Honor. Punishable by life in prison, you understand that? I do. And you want to represent yourself? Yes, sir. You understand that I am telling you, that Judge Fuson has told you, that it is not a wise, we do not consider it a wise decision. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. All right. I'm going to let you represent yourself. Thank you. Much has been said about going pro se, which literally means on one's own behalf. Perhaps the most famous opinion on the matter comes from the 16th President of the United States, a quote often attributed to Abe Lincoln states, he who represents himself has a fool for a client. 
Whether he's the true originator of the proverb or not, by the end of the trial, it's clear that the principle held. Story checks out. Arguably one of the most famous examples of a pro se perpetrator, serial killer Ted Bundy went solo in his proceedings. He made such an impression on the court, the judge acknowledged his performance after the verdict. Such a total waste, I think, of humanity that I've experienced in this court. You're a bright young man. You made a good lawyer. I'd love to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. Take care of yourself. Now that he was free of all those pesky legal experts, Trevor could really express himself. After all, his logic told him he was the best person to cross-examine his terrified ex-wife turned victim. Would the accused husband fare better than Bundy? Tell us what you think. Did Trevor really believe this is the best legal step for him? Or did he fire his attorney right before cross-examination just for some sick revenge? Let us know below in the comments. And if you're enjoying our show, please help us tickle the YouTube algorithm and reach more viewers. Just hit like, subscribe, and remember to ring the bell to be notified of new episodes. For big crimes in small packages, check out our side channel, AC Tidbits. Now, where were we? The stage was set for a courtroom drama more compelling than a well-written legal thriller. Elisa Mathewson would be confronted by her one-time tormentor, forced to relive the 55 most horrific hours of her life. And although she rarely looked him in the eye or even in his direction... She sat there and took it like a brave champion. She had support of friends and family in the courtroom, including her new husband, Jeff Mathewson. She answered questions with confidence and managed to restrain her anger remarkably well, an ability her ex-husband clearly lacked. Elisa Mathewson looked understandably dreading and fearful. Trevor politely addressed her before going on to question his captive, for over four hours. Good morning, Ms. Madison. He began his query as Elisa picked out something, anything else, to look at rather than Trevor's sociopathic stare. But right now, it was time for Trevor to play lawyer, gambling at the biggest stakes of his life. He began by questioning why there were no apparent signs of struggle. Would you agree that uh, in the previous photos that the walls also uh, were clean. There's no dents, no scratches, no marks. Yes. Okay. His questions and his calm demeanor perhaps gave us a brief, chilling glimpse into a marriage fraught with Trevor's controlling ways. Other than just uh, your comments about going into some boats or offshore, do you, do you recall what other things we were talking about for three hours? <clears throat> There, there wasn't talking going on at this point. There was fighting, wrestling, me trying to get free and out of the house. And did those photographs uh, depict the kind of wrestling and fighting that you're talking about? To me, they did. They did? Yes. Then his questions took a devious turn. Her ex-husband began to question her about their sex life. Did we ever go beyond just regular intercourse? Objection, Judge. Relevance. I'll not allow it overruled. Ms. Matheson, you may answer. I was a teenager when I began dating you. I'm sorry, can you answer the question? I'm answering wait, the question. Wait, wait, wait. Don't, yeah, don't, don't cut her off. Um, but unless you intended to narrow the scope? I just didn't want to get into her, the history that she's starting out with. I did want to just ask well, do you have during a specific, our marriage. Do you have a, specific, a more specific question? I asked during our marriage. I didn't ask about her teenage years. She started out with her teenage years. I asked about our marriage. Did we do more than just regular intercourse? Well, do you have a more specific question than, I mean, that's a broad more than, do you have a specific question during the marriage? Okay, I can be specific. Um, did we, during our marriage, use uh, peripheral objects in our sexual activity? More in the early marriage. 
prior to having five children. As he moves on from the subject, Trevor turns to their turbulent encounter. He appeared to enjoy it when she began to squirm a bit. What did we do? You tied me up. Before she left? After she left? After she left, you tied me up. Where? In my bed. In your bed. And you said this was with string? You said... Sorry, Christmas lights? And you said a vacuum cleaner? Yes. Next, he asked her what they were talking about for all those hours. This was her amazing response. You can go on and on and on about random nonsense, and it is, it, it's incoherent nonsense, but you can just go on about it. Okay. Um, do you remember specifically what incoherent nonsense I was talking about? Chartering a boat, money in offshore accounts, having going to the island, having a bodyguard to watch me, your parents' involvement, our children, what happened through the marriage. There's many, many, many topics that you could go on for hours about. Some of that rambling was about his parents' involvement. In reality, they knew nothing about this, but in Trevorland, they came and picked up the kids at the crack of dawn and took them home. He never told her the truth about how they actually got home. You said that I said that my parents came and got the children. Yes. At 5.30 in the morning. Yes. And, and do you believe that is a reasonable thing to expect? I had no reason to believe that a 14-year-old drove approximately 30 minutes at that time of day with her siblings in the car. There was no reason for me to believe that that ever would occur. So my only obvious answer would be that your parents came to the home and took the kids, which is what you told me. With his attempt at gaslighting failed, he focused again on the times they had sex. When he asked her if it was true they had sex after he made the videos, she acknowledged he untied her hogtied limbs and had sex with her. Was he arguing it was consensual or reveling in the memory of his conquest? And let's talk about um, sex. Um, you simply call it sex in your statements, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, did I threaten you to have sex? Mm -hmm. You broke into my home in the middle of the night when I was sleeping, attacked me and tied me up. I take that as, yes, you threatened me to have sex with you. Yes. I'm asking you specifically, before we had sex, did I threaten you or force you to have sex with me? My answer is yes, you forced me to have sex with you. Did I hold you down? No. Did I push you? Not at that time of having sex, but prior to having sex, you did push me. You did hold me down. You did tie me up. You did attack me and you did break into my home when I was sleeping. You raped me. So you're calling it rape? It is. That is the definition of rape, to come into someone's home and attack them and tie them up and then have sex with them. That is the definition of rape. Next, bizarrely, the talk turned to Netflix. It seems Trevor left his hogtied hostage something to binge watch every time he left the room to plan her homicide. Do you remember what was the theme or the storyline behind the, the television show The Crown we were watching that night? Objection, Judge, relevance? No rule. The theme of the crown, we were not watching it together. You tied me up, turned it on, and left. And I honestly, from the adrenaline and all, I can't tell you what happened on that show because I was trying to get free. But you remember it being put on? I remember that that's what was on. And I have yet I had cannot watch the show because that is what was playing. So why would I go back and now try to watch this show? Later, Elisa answered a question about the time Trevor caught her trying to escape her restraints. 
He was not pleased and immediately imposed his will. And then after some time, I started wiggling and trying to get free and you opened the door and you came in and you put the pillow over my face with full force. Okay. Your statement was uh, that you knew, you knew I was going to kill you when you saw my face. Correct? Yes. How did you know what was in my heart? How did you know what was in my mind? All I saw was an expression of evil and hatred. And at that time, my thought is, I'm, he's here to kill me. I'm going to die. Did I say I was going to kill you? No. He placed the pillow over my face with such force until I lost consciousness and had thoughts that I was going to meet Jesus and this was my last breath. That is why I have reasons to believe that you were there to kill me because I came that close to death. Trevor Summers had almost reached the end of his questioning, but there was one subject he just couldn't seem to drop their sexual encounters. Was he just enjoying it at this point? Have you ever made a previous recorded statement about our marriage? Um, stating that uh, sex really didn't mean much to you. Um, it's not a big deal to have sex with, with me. Objection, Judge, relevance? So moved. That means I answer. I answer that? Yes. Okay. Yes. I had sex with you because it didn't, it didn't make a difference to me one way or another. It meant nothing and I didn't, didn't, didn't matter. Regardless, the final verbal scuffle with her real life attacker ended triumphantly in her favor, as her final words on the stand were the perfect summation of her strategy to just stay alive. Uh, you say I'm promising you money from offshore accounts and all these other uh, wild things. Was it the same thing? Did you have sex with me because it didn't matter? No, I had sex with you so I didn't die. That is what happened this weekend. That is the biggest difference. I was staying alive and I had sex with you to stay alive. After hearing from a few more witnesses, the sides gave their closing arguments and the case went to the jury. They wouldn't need long. And after seven hours of deliberation, they had a verdict. Mr. Summers, I'll ask that you please stand for the publishing of the verdict. State of Florida versus Trevor Stephen Summers. Count one. The defendant is guilty of attempted murder in the first degree. We the jury finds as follows as the count two. The defendant is guilty of attempted in the first degree as follows as the count three. The defendant is guilty of kidnapping as charged as the count four. The defendant is guilty of sexual battery by a person 18 or older, count five. The defendant is guilty of sexual battery by a person 18 or older, count six. The defendant is guilty of child neglect as charged, count seven. The defendant is guilty of child neglect as charged, count eight. The defendant is guilty of child neglect as charged, count nine. The defendant is guilty of child neglect as charged, count 10. The defendant is guilty of grand theft motor vehicle as charged, count 11. The defendant is guilty of violation of domestic violence injunction as charged. So say we all dated this 26th day of August, 2022. Trevor Summers is scheduled to be sentenced on October 3rd and faces up to life in prison. As for Elisa Mathewson, she's won the support of her children back from a conniving manipulator. Her new husband, Jeff, was steady by her side all along, and her unflinching performance under intense pressure is an inspiration to survivors everywhere. We don't have to part ways just yet. Stay right here on Absolutely Criminal and check out what's going on with alleged suitcase killer Sarah Boone, the convicted mother killer Amy Day, 
And here's one more messed up story we think you'll enjoy. Sit back, relax, and let the darkness come alive. 